Amen. All right, well, we're there in Revelation chapter number 13, and tonight I am preaching on the subject of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and the abomination of desolation. We're going to cover all of that. And uh, Revelation 13, the reason we read there is because that's really the quintessential chapter about the mark of the, about the Antichrist and, and, and all of that. Let me just start off uh, by, by repeating what I said uh, the last time I preached uh, here at this conference uh, about what the Apostle Paul had said in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, in, in, when it comes to prophecy, there are some things that are extremely clear. You know, I, I think it was uh, Pastor Robinson who was saying there's, there's a structure there that cannot be denied. It's the tribulation, the rapture, the wrath of God. You can't get away from that. That's extremely clear. That's not up for debate. You cannot be intellectually honest and not acknowledge that that's the structure that God has given when it comes to prophecy. However, when you get into the details of how all these things are going to play out, obviously uh, some of those things we don't really know exactly how it's all going to play, play out. Let me read the verse for you again. Remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. He said, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So obviously we try to study the Bible and try to make sense out of it, and we look at different parts of Scripture and try to understand it. But the closer we get to the actual events, it will become more and more clear. So what I'd like to do tonight as we study the subject of the Antichrist and really the rise and fall of the Antichrist, I want to try to help you uh, to remember just the chronology of the life of the Antichrist and the, the event in his life. I'm going to give you three parts, three sections of the Antichrist, and they're all really uh, characterized as a separate rise. There's three different rises of the Antichrist that will hopefully be a way for you to remember uh, the chronology of his life and also be able to see the event of prophecy. You're there in Revelation 13. Look down at verse number 1, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because this has been dealt with already, but I want you to understand that the Bible is teaching us here when it equates the Antichrist to a beast. Notice verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven horns, excuse me, seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Now, we're being given this, these, uh, the, these descriptions of a beast, but then we're told that he's like different types of beast. And the idea here, and I'm not going to take the time to develop this tonight, but in Daniel, we are told of these different government, these world empires that have came through history, and they are described as different beasts. And when we get to Revelation 13, and we talk about the beast, you know, the, the, the Antichrist, the, he's described as basically compounding all of these. Verse 2, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. That matches Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. That matches Daniel chapter 7 and verse 5. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That matches Daniel chapter 7 and verse 4. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So I want you to understand that this government of the Antichrist is really just a continuation or a compounding of the world empires that have, that have gone through history because it has been Satan from the beginning who's been putting these people up and giving them power. And we understand that God is the one who ultimately allows them to rule and, uh, uh, you know, the heavens do rule is what Daniel says, and God is in charge of all that. But it is the, the devil that props these people up. Look there, look there at verse number 2 again, and you'll see that the government of the Antichrist is powered and enabled by Satan. Look at verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, who's the dragon? That's Satan, you know, and, and if, you'd, if you'd like to take notes, you can write next to that, Revelation 12.9. In Revelation 12.9, the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels cast out with him. So we know that the dragon is Satan. It says, And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Notice verse number, uh, verse number 4 there. 
I, look, look at verse 3. And I saw one of the heads uh, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, notice, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. So we need to understand, and, and we bring this up often in our preaching, uh, but you know, the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you know, in our movement, we have a lot of people that like to look into, you know, things like secret societies, right? And you, we talk about the, the Masons and, and the Illuminati and the Bilderberg and, 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 all, and how they control, you know, these secret societies that are really controlling government and controlling the economy. But what you need to understand that at the top of all of that is Satan, He's the one that's controlling. You say, well, it's the Jews with all their money, and look, the Jews are going to get, you know, what's coming to them. We're actually going to see that in the sermon uh, tonight. But, you know, it's Satan. It's the synagogue of Satan that's controlling these people, that is uh, pulling the strings on the puppets, and the goal of the devil is to bring in this one world government, one world religion, that the Antichrist is going to uh, head up. Notice there, we're going to just skip ahead for a little bit just so you can see how the, government's, the government of the Antichrist is not only enabled and powered by the devil, but it's also a one-world government. Look at verse 7 there. It says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. We'll come back to that later. And power was given him, talking about the beast, the Antichrist. Notice, over all kindreds, that's families, and tongues, that's languages, and nations. So he is in control of basically the entire world. He is controlling all kindreds and tongues and nations. Skip down to verse number 17, same chapter, Revelation 13, 17. And that no man might buy or sell. Notice that he has control over the world currency. He can control whether people buy or sell. And you know, for, for, for thousands of years, the way that people uh, had money was they basically had gold and silver and precious stones, you know, and things that they could uh, exchange for goods and services. But, you know, our, as we get more and uh, closer to this one world government, you know, what they've done is they've taken us off of the gold coins, right, the silver coins, and they, they put us on cash that represents the gold, that represents the silver. Then they told us, you know, you're just on cash that represents nothing, right? It's like a bunch of grown-ups playing Monopoly with Monopoly money, right? And now they're even taking the cash away, and, they're, and they put it on a card, right? Then they put a chip on the card, right? And then the chip's going to go in your head, right? So, you know, it, it, it's this slow process to take us to what? You say, well, what's the point of that? So that the money can be controlled, so that you will not be able to buy or sell without them having, uh, be, having the ability to either stop you or give you the permission to. Why? Because all of this is Satan's master plan. He's wanting to bring in this one world government. He's wanting to bring in this one world religion that he might go ahead and fight against the saints. So not only is the government of the Antichrist empowered by Satan. Not only is it a one world government, we see that he's given power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Not only does he control the currency, and, we, and that's really the truth. When people control money, they, they control everything. That's why the Jews control everything, right? Because they control money, and they control uh, a lot of the money. Uh, but I want you to notice, and, and keep your place there in Revelation 13, and go to Revelation chapter number 6 just real quickly. When it comes to this, this one world government, how does this government come to pass? And here's what I want you to understand. The government of the Antichrist, that last beast, that compounding and continuation of the Babylon uh, a world system, the world empire, the one world government, one world religion, that government is a result of a world war. See, usually when people talk about the Antichrist, they talk about peace, right? And they talk about the league that he makes and the covenants that he makes. And all of that is in Scripture. But I want you to notice that the first time we are introduced to the Antichrist in the book of Revelation, what we are told about him is that he is going forth conquering and to conquer. Notice there Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw when the Lamb, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, opened 
one of the seals. That's the first seal. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and of, of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. Now, I want you to notice that this is the Antichrist. Now, there's somebody else who comes on a white horse later on in the book of Revelation, and that's the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And it's not a coincidence that the Antichrist comes on a white horse. What you need to understand about the Antichrist and what you need to understand about the devil is that they, he's an imposter. You know, Satan is always trying to uh, copycat what God does. The Lord has a perfect word, so Satan has his corrupt word. The Lord has an army of soul winners, so Satan has his army of Jehovah's false witnesses, right? You know, false Mormons out there. And, and you, you can go on and on. You know, he's always trying to copy uh, the, the, uh, God. And here we see that the Antichrist shows up on a white horse, and he, sat, and he that sat on him had a bow, that's a weapon, and a crown was given unto him, Notice, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So the first time we see the Antichrist, he's in fight mode. He's in conquer mode. He's in war mode. Notice verse number four, and there went out another horse that was red. I'm sorry, verse three. We skipped verse three. And when he had opened the, the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another ho horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon, notice, to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So we notice that the Antichrist shows up at seal number one, and he's going forth conquering and to conquer, and then seal number two, there's a red horse, and he takes peace from the earth. Why? Because there's going to be worldwide war. Keep your place there in Revelation. Go to Matthew chapter number 24. Matthew chapter number 24, you should be familiar with the passage, but let's look at it. Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ was asked, you know, about the signs of his coming and the things that we should be looking for. And he didn't say, hey, you know, it's, it's imminent, don't look for anything. You know, don't watch for anything. In fact, he said the exact opposite. You know, the reason we have the Olivet Discourse is because they asked him, hey, what should we be looking for? And then he gave them this whole sermon. You know, the, the first prophecy conference was, on, you know, on, on uh, you know, the Olivet Discourse. On the Mount Olive, you know, he gave them a, 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 a discourse on prophecy and what they should be looking for and what they should be watching. And part of that, Matthew 24 and verse 6 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Notice verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation. Now why is this? Because the world war is just the beginning. You know, let me just warn you, when World War III breaks out, First of all, we don't know, you know, it, it'll probably be World War III, but maybe it'll be World War IV. Maybe it'll be World War V, you know. So before you go off running in the wilderness with all your camp gear and your guns, you know, just, just remember that the only way we know for sure is the abomination of desolation. We're going to get to that. But, but he says, look, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of war, and you shall see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. So look, when Trump leads us into World War III, right, you know, hey, pay attention, right, watch. Don't be like the preach rivers who are like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, right? Don't be like those shirts running around here with the monkeys, you know. I don't want to hear it. You know, pay attention, but also realize that that's the beginning of sorrows. The end is not yet. Now, the Antichrist takes power, and he, and he basically creates this one world government as a result of a world war. Now, part of that is that he wins the war through conquering. We saw that in Revelation 6. He went forth conquering and to conquer. Go to Daniel chapter number 7. When you get to Daniel, put a ribbon or a bookmark there because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it. You might as well do the same thing with Matthew 24, of course. And uh, you guys are smart, so we should be able to find these books fairly easy, easily. Daniel chapter 7, 
verse 23. See, the Antichrist will win this war, war through the con- by the fact that he's going to uh, have conquest and he's going to have victories over some. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, notice what the Bible says. Daniel 7 and verse 23, thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth that shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. That's what we saw described in Revelation 13. And shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Notice verse 24, and the ten horns. Didn't we see that in Revelation 13? Out of this kingdom are, notice, ten kings. By the way, these are also the ten toes In the image in Daniel chapter 2. Notice what it says. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another, that's the Antichrist, shall arise after them. And he, the Antichrist, shall be diverse from the first. And he, notice what it says, shall subdue three kings. So we know that in this world war, he's going to have a victory over three kings. He's going to fight three kings and beat them. Notice uh, uh, verse number 19, same chapter. Just go up to verse number 19. Notice what the Bible says. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, uh, 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 break in pieces and stamped the residue of his feet. Notice verse 20. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom, notice, three fell even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth speaking very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So the Bible tells us here that the Antichrist, when he shows up at the first seal, you know, he goes forth conquering and to conquer, and we know that he has three victories. There's three kings that he subdues. There's three kings that fell or that fall before him. So part of the way that he wins this world war is through conquest. But another way that he wins the world war is through treaties. You're there in Daniel chapter 7. Look at Daniel chapter number 11. Daniel chapter number 11. Daniel chapter number 11 and verse number 21. Notice what the Bible says. Daniel chapter number 11 and verse 21. The Bible says, And his estate, and in, this, and, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person. That's the Antichrist to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably, notice, and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant, notice verse 23, and after the league made with him, he shall, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. So we see here that we are told that he obtained the kingdom by flatteries. We, he's referred to as the prince of the covenant. We're told that he made a league with them, and, and then he works deceitfully after that. So we see that he conquers some. But he also makes treaties with others, and the result of this is that he wins this world war when kingdoms go against kingdom. And, and here's the thing, and, and we don't know this for sure, but it may very well be that this league that is being referred to, that may be, you know, the infamous covenant that is confirmed with many for one week. You know, it may be that this covenant, and, and you know, it may be, we don't know for sure, but it may be that this covenant has in that deal the rebuilding of the temple because that would be at the beginning of the week and we know by the time that we get to the midst of the week they're already doing the sacrifices and and he's basically stopping that which means they've been doing it for a while so this you know it it may be that this league or this covenant that maybe, maybe ends that world war that allows him to take power over the entire world is that covenant that, that, uh, that, that is at the beginning at, of Daniel's 70th week there. Uh, you know, Daniel 9.27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So, you know, it's like Pastor Anderson said in, in After the Tribulation, World War I brought us the League of Nations, and World War II brought us uh, the United Nations, and World War III may very well bring us the new world order, may well, very well bring us that, that, that uh, government, that one world government. So you need to understand, when, you, when you're thinking about the Antichrist, you need to understand that first, there's a political rise. A man shows up, a political leader shows up, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. 
So, you know, he's probably going to be a Republican, right? Or, you know, he, he's going to go, it, it may be Trump, you know, I'm just kidding. But, you know, he's going to go forth and he's going to beat at least three guys. He's going to make leagues with others and they're going to establish this world power. But there's a second rise. The first rise is the political rise of the Antichrist. But there's a second rise, and for those of you taking notes, if you like to take notes, there's the physical rise of the Antichrist. Now you'd say, well, what's the physical rise? Go back to Revelation 13 and look at verse number 3. See, there has to be a way that we transition from simply being a political leader to being a religious leader or deity or whatever they're going to call them. And that is done through the physical rise of the Antichrist. Now, if you remember when we saw in Revelation 6, we saw that he was an imitator, right? In Revelation 6, 2, and I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him. He comes imitating Christ, copying Christ. And the Antichrist is going to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ at his greatest, you know, act, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You're there in Revelation 13. Look at verse number 3. Revelation 13 and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. And I saw one of his heads. This is the beast, the Antichrist. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. So notice the Bible tells us here that he takes a wound to the head. And, you know, obviously we don't know for sure how this is all going to play out. Maybe it's going to be like a JFK assassination, you know, but the guy, he's wounded in the head, and everybody thinks he's dead. In fact, they'll, they'll proclaim him dead. They'll say he's dead. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Notice, and all the world wandered after the beast, and they worshiped. Now, when you, you see the word worship there, now you're using religious terminology. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. We're going to come back to that. Look at verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So I want you to notice that he was wounded. His head was, it, it, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Go to Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation chapter number 11, and we'll see more about, you know, how the Antichrist dies and comes back. Now, look, this is miraculous, or th this is, you know, not a natural event. It is the power of Satan, and you need to understand that Satan has power. You know, Satan is able to do these things, and that's why, that's why you, you shouldn't be impressed when these false prophets, you know, maybe they do things and you think like, oh, wow, well, that was actually power. Well, Satan has power. You know, the prophets of Baal, they really did think when Elijah, you know, uh, challenged them, they really did think they could bring fire down from heaven. You know, they probably had done it before. We'll see here that the false prophet will do it at the end times, but this beast is wounded to death, as it were to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Look at Revelation 11 and verse 7. Revelation 11 and verse 7 says this, And when they shall have finished their testimony. We're, we're kind of fast-forwarding. So this is talking about the two witnesses. But I want you to notice what it says about the beast. The beast, notice what it says about it, ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. Now what's the bottomless pit? That's hell. So he ascended out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them, the two witnesses, and shall overcome them and kill them. Look at Revelation 17 and verse number 8. Revelation 17 and verse 8. Again, I just want you to see the description of, of, the, of the beast, of the Antichrist. Revelation 17 and verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Do you see that? And go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they behold, notice, the beast that was and is not and yet is. And whenever you see that terminology, that phrase, is not, in Scripture, it's used about people who have died or people who people think are dead. 
So here, the Bible is telling us he was and is not and yet is. It tells us that he ascended out of the bottomless pit. It, it tells us that he took a wound to the head, and, and, the, and it was a wound uh, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. So I want you to understand that there's, first of all, a political rise to the Antichrist where he goes forth conquering and to conquer. He conquers three kings. He makes a treaty. He makes a league. He establishes a one-world government, eventually under a one-world currency. But then there's a physical rise of the Antichrist, and he takes a wound to the head. You know, and, and the Bible doesn't spell this out for us, but I would imagine that they probably think he's dead for three days. And then he comes back, you know, quote unquote, from the dead. And, and you, you say, well, what is he doing? He's imitating Christ. He's coming on a white horse. He's pretending to be Christ. And I'm not saying that he's going to exactly say, you know, I'm Jesus Christ. But he's basically, that's what Satan's doing. He's trying to mock at it. Now, th there's an importance here when it comes to the Antichrist before he takes the wound to the head and after he comes back, quote-unquote, from the dead. And I want you to notice that. Look, look there in Revelation 17 again and look at verse 8. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. I want you to notice this phrase, and go into perdition. Do you see that? And go into perdition. I want you to notice that word perdition. Nothing in our Bibles is there by accident or coincidence. Everything is, is, is exactly where the Holy Spirit wanted it. And God will often use words in Scripture so that we can connect them to other passages so we can really get an idea of what's going on here. And the Bible tells us that after he ascends out of the bottomless pit, after that he goes, or he, it says, and go into perdition. So what is that talking about? Well, keep your place there in Revelation. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And again, my goal tonight is just to give you a very biblical outline of the Antichrist, hopefully by remembering that there's a political rise and remembering that there's a physical rise. You know, that'll, hopefully that will help you to understand this when you're talking to people about it, when you're explaining it to people, when you're studying it out for yourself. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that phrase, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What is that? That's the rapture. Our gathering together unto him. That ye, be so, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now look, based on the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because we started at verse 1, 1 and 2, what is the day of Christ? The day of Christ is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you say, well, well I, I need more evidence. All right, let me just, you, and you can study that phrase out in Scripture, but let me just read for you from Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Philippians 1, 6 says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What is that? That's the day of Christ. Now, you say, well, well how does that prove that, that's the, that the day of Christ is the day of our gathering together unto him? Well, here's the thing. When you got saved, you, were, you didn't get saved by works, but you were saved unto good works. You weren't saved by works, but God's working on you. And God's trying to help you become, you know, more like his son and be conformed to the image of his son. And every day he's working on you. And by the way, that's why you ought to be reading your Bible every day. That's why you ought to be praying every day. That's why you ought to be in church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Because you say, why? Because, you, because God has given you a pastor as a gift to preach to you the word of God to get the sin out of your life, to help you walk in, in the way that God has ordained. Why? Because he's working on you. You know, and, and some of you are, are so smart about everything, you can't find a church to be a part of. Because because every, cause, cause, cause everybody in your area, look, if you're that smart, then you need to move. Because I can tell you right now, you're not smarter than Pastor Anderson. You're not smarter than Pastor Romero. 
You're not pa- smarter than Pastor McMurtry or Pastor Major or Pastor Johnson or, pa- you know, or all the men here. Hey, you know, if, if you're so smart that you can't find a man of God to get under and listen to the preaching, then, then just move somewhere. But you need to be in the house of God. Why? Because God has ordained that to be a place where you can get preached at, where you can get your face ripped off. Why? So that you'll be more like Christ. God, see, God is working on you every day. And you say, when will God be done working on you? When you get your glorified body. When this corruptible puts on incorruption. When this mortal puts on immortality. Hey, he won't be done until the rapture. That's why he says, hey, I be confident in this very thing, that he, uh, he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So what's the day of Jesus Christ? It's the rapture. That's why it's in the same context as the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Notice verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Let no man deceive you by any means. Let no man deceive you by any means. That, that no man includes Keith Gomez. Did you know that? Let no man deceive you by any means. That no man uh, includes, you know, Sam Gibb and Sluter or, you know, and any other idiot out there. Hey, that includes the Bible call. That includes John Hagee. That includes the Left Behind books. Hey, let no man deceive you by any means. Notice what it says. For that day. What day? The day of Christ. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ when he'll be done, you know, performing his work on us. Because that day, notice what it says, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now listen to me very carefully, all right? The King James Bible is perfect, preserved, without error, okay? And there's no need for us to ever, those of us that are saved, to ever have to go back to the Greek, right? Because the Holy Spirit teaches us, like Pastor McMurtry said, that falling is always down, not up. Okay, so you don't have to go back to the Greek to get that. But you know, some of these unsaved heretics, it, it would, this is like probably the one passage that might benefit them to go back to the Greek. Because that falling away there is apostasia. All right? That's what's coming. The apostasy, the falling away, the people moving away from the truth of God. They, they're, they're looking for men that'll, uh, that, that'll uh, make them feel good, that'll teach them lies, that'll, that'll just, that, that's what, that's, look, you say, you, I, I want an illustration of the falling away. Look at the average church in America today. They're not preaching the truth. They're not preaching the word of God. They're not telling people what the Bible says. They're just telling people what they want to hear so they'll, th- so they'll th- put money in the offering plate. So that Joel Osteen can drive around in his nice vehicle. Look, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That means, you know what that means? That means that it can't happen at any moment. That, mean, that, that, that destroys imminency. That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed The son of, what's the word? Perdition. So look, the Bible tells us that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will not come until the man of sin is revealed, meaning we we see him, we can identify him, and he's called the son of perdition. Now, what's so important about that word perdition? In Revelation 17, 8, we're told that he would go into perdition. In, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, we're told that he is the son of perdition. Now, what's interesting about that is that there's only one other person in the Bible who is called the son of perdition. Go to John chapter number 17. John chapter number 17. Now, again, nothing in the Bible is, that there, is, is there by mistake or accident. God, if he used the term son of perdition about the Antichrist, and then he used the term son of perdition somewhere else, And those are the only times those terms are used. He wants us to connect those thoughts. He wants us to figure out, okay, well, what's what's the connection here? So who's the other son of perdition in Scripture? John 17 and verse 12. John 17, 12 says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy thy name. Those Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. 
And then he says, he says this, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, who, who was the one that he lost? Judas Iscariot. The only other person in the Bible that is called the son of perdition is Judas Iscariot. Other than that, the only other person that's called the son of perdition is the Antichrist, the beast. You say, well, what's the connection? What's the similarity? Go to John chapter number 13. John chapter number 13, verse number 26. John chapter 13 and verse 26. John 13, 26 says this. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped a sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Notice verse 27. And after the sop, notice what the Bible says, Satan entered into him. Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now, here's what's interesting. As you read the New Testament, as you read the Bible, you find that Jesus comes across many people that are possessed of devils, that, that we would call demon-possessed. But my, my belief is that Satan himself never indwelled anybody as far as possessing somebody. The only person he ever possessed the only person he ever felt the need like, I can't give this to a thousand devils. This is too big of a job. I need to just do it myself. You know, the only person he ever possessed, the only person he ever entered into was Judas Iscariot when Judas was going to betray the Lord Jesus Christ because Satan thought it was too big of a job. He thought he was on the brink of victory. Little did he know that he was on the brink of defeat. Because, you know, they crucified him, but three days later, he rose from the grave. And, and, and Satan entered into Judas, and the Bible refers to him as the son of perdition. So why is the Antichrist called the son of perdition when he comes back from the bottom of the spit? Well, probably because he's going to be possessed by Satan himself. See, it's too, it's too big of a job. The, the battle of Armageddon, he thinks, you know, this is my shot to destroy Christ and to be able. He, he fooled me that one time. For three days, I was rejoicing, you know, but now he thinks I've got another shot. I've got another chance. So the Antichrist, the man, the Antichrist, has a political rise. He unites the world under a, a one-world government. He takes a shot to the head, and then Satan indwells him. He comes back, ascended out of the bottomless pit, and now he's the man of sin, the son of perdition. So we see a political rise. We also see a physical rise of his body. He resurrects from the grave. But then we see, thirdly, tonight, a religious rise. There's a political rise, and there's a physical rise, but there's also a religious rise. Go back to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, look at verse 9. Revelation 13, 9 says this, If any, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Notice verse 11. And I beheld another beast. Now this isn't the beast, the Antichrist. This is another beast. And in Revelation 16, 13, he's named the false prophet. This is a, 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 a preacher. This is a religious leader. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had... Two horns like a lamb. Now, who's often referred to as the lamb? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? The lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Here we're told that he had two horns like a lamb, meaning he looks religious. He looks like he might be a quote-unquote Christian, right? He, he, he kind of looks like he might be connected to the lamb, and he spake as a dragon, though. So when he opens his mouth, everything that comes out of his mouth is satanic, this is a religious leader. Notice verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast, meaning he has access to the same power of the first beast before him. Right? And what was the power of the first beast? The dragon. And we'll see that here in a second. And causeth, note what it says. And causeth the earth and them which dwell, there, which dwell therein to worship the first beast. That's the Antichrist. So you got the second beast causing the world to worship the first beast, why, whose deadly wound was healed. 
See, when the Antichrist dies and they declare him dead, and three days later he resurrects from the grave, then this other beast, this religious leader, comes on the scene and he says, hey, this is God. This is the Son of God. This is deity. This is someone who, sh who we should uh, uh, worship. That's why verse 12 says, And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and he caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Notice verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. So notice Satan can do wonder, uh, wondrous things like that. He says, it says that he causeth a fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So look, this false prophet is going to be performing miracles, is going to make, be making fire come down from heaven, He's going to deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles. And by the way, this is why the Bible says, you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew 24, 24, it says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, now that means it's not possible, but if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So look, the, the elect will not be deceived. Let me give you some hope for the preach ribbers. By the time the Antichrist shows up, they'll figure it out. I mean, it'll probably be about three seconds before their head gets chopped off. But, you know, the last thought that'll go through their heads right before they, you know, uh, 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 end up in heaven, you know, the last thought that's going to go through their heads is going to be like, he was right. That guy was right. I thought he was crazy the whole time. If it were possible, so they shall deceive the very elect. Now, look, let me just, this is just my opinion, and I can't prove this to you from the Bible. But this false prophet, I believe, has to be a religious leader that has a world stage. Now, obviously, we don't know who that is, and we don't know who that could be. If I had, and this is my personal opinion, and I could be wrong about this, so, you know, I'm not trying to argue with you if you've got a different thought on this. But my personal opinion that it is that it's probably going to be a pope. And, and the reason for that is because even if you take the most famous religious leader in America today, you know, Joel Osteen, he's still like, like the Joel Osteens or the Rick Warrens, you know, the Bill Hybels, they still don't have the, the clout that someone like the Pope has. I mean, when the Pope shows up in your country, the president meets with them, you know. And, and here's the thing, you know, the Pope for a long time has seemed like he's just not, you know, not connected or whatever. But, uh, you know, we've noticed that this recent pope has, I mean, he's gotten younger by Pope Sanders, <laughs> right? He's still really old. But, uh, uh, you know, he's gotten younger by Pope Sanders, but he, he's more appealing to young people. And if I take a guess, there's probably, I would imagine that there's going to be a pope that's going to be very charismatic, very uh, dynamic, who's going to be this world leader. And I could be wrong about that, and it may be somebody else. It would also make sense to me, though, because when you study Babylon in the book of Revelation, the description fits a description of the Catholic Church. Now, we know that the Catholic Church is not Babylon. The Catholic Church, I believe, one day was Babylon on this earth or had the spirit of Babylon upon them when they, rule, when they did rule the world. They don't today, but I, I just kind of think that, you know, God's going to use a pope in this capacity or allow a pope in this capacity. So he just kind of gives them a shout out in the Babylon description, you know, just to give us a hint, right? And here's the thing, even if I'm wrong, th this is still true about the pope today. He may look like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon, okay? Even if it's not the pope, the pope is satanic, all right? He's not, don't, don't listen to him. There's nothing good about him. Your Pastor McMurtry is telling us that the Pope got raptured in the Left Behind series, but he's not getting raptured in real life, all right? He's a reprobate. So, you know, so they're, they're wrong about that too, turns out. Go to Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter number 9. Now, we saw the political rise. We saw the physical rise. Now we're looking at the religious rise. After the Antichrist comes back from the dead, a false prophet shows up and basically begins to point and say, hey, 
worship the beast. Worship this man. Worship the Antichrist. We know when he comes back, he's no longer just a man. He's the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's, he's indwelled by Satan himself. And the false prophet begins to call him, you know, and say, hey, worship him. Now, what happens when they, the transition goes from a political leader to a religious leader or deity is that they set up what is referred to in Scripture as the abomination of desolation or, you know, the abomination that make it desolate. Now, in Daniel chapter number 9, we are told about the abomination of desolation. And I just want you to notice a couple of things about the abomination. What is the abomination of desolation? In Daniel 9, 27, the Bible says this, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's the Antichrist. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So I want you to notice that the abomination, he shall make it Desolate. Look at, look at uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 11. Daniel chapter number 12 and verse number 11. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 11. Notice what the Bible says. Daniel 12, 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate. I want you to notice these two words. Set up. Do you see that? The abomination that maketh desolate set up. There shall be 1,290 days. So when the Bible refers to the abomination of desolation, it tells us that they set it up. So it's not a person, it's an object. It's spoken of as an, in, uh, 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 it's spoken of as an inanimate object. It, the, they tell us that they set it up or they, they placed it. N notice, go to Mark chapter number 13. Mark chapter number 13. Look at verse number 14. Mark chapter 13 and verse 14, Mark chapter 13 and verse 14, the Bible says, But when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where, notice, it ought not. Again, it's being spoken of as an object, where it ought not. Let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee unto the mountains. So in Daniel, we're told that it was set up. In Mark 13, we're told that it's standing where it ought not. You say, okay, well, what's the abomination of desolation? What is it in the book of Revelation? We'll go back to Revelation 13. Look at verse number 14. Revelation 13 and verse number 14. Revelation 13, 14, the Bible says, And deceive them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they shall, that, notice what, what it says, that they should make an image to the beast. That's the abomination of desolation. They set an image, they place it, they make an image. Now look, we don't know what this image is going to exactly be like. But it says that they should make an image of the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Notice verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now look, this image may be miraculous. Maybe it's technology. We don't know what it is, but here's what we know. It's going to be an object, something that they refer to as an it, Something that they place, an image, and people have to worship this image or they will die. And you say, well, what, what is the reason for this? Because the Antichrist has basically declared himself and been declared God. Go, to, go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I know I'm giving you a lot, a lot of scriptures uh, tonight, but I, I want you to be able to have this and, you know, take notes and really understand it. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 says this, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except the come of falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right, so I, I do believe there's going to be a temple here, and he's going to walk into that temple. He's going to sit in that temple of God and basically declare himself God. 
He's going to declare, you know, I'm God. The false prophet is going to be declaring I'm God. They're going to set up the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, there's something else that you need to understand about this time of the abomination of desolation. Go with me to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter number 14. If you start at the end of the Old Testament, you got the book of Malachi. Right before, right before Malachi, you got the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14, and look at verse 1. Do me a favor, because we're, keep, keep your place in Zechariah. We're going to leave it. We're going to come back to it. Zechariah chapter 14. Look at verse number 1. Zechariah 14, verse 1. The Bible says this, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and, they, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Zechariah 14, 2. For I, this is God speaking, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So the Bible talks here about a time when God gathers the nations against Jerusalem to battle. You say, well, what's going on here? What, what, what is happening? Go to Luke chapter number 21. Luke chapter number 21 and verse number 20. Luke chapter number 21 and verse number 20. Luke 21 and verse 20. The Bible says this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 21 and verse 20. Luke 21 is basically speaking about the events from Zechariah chapter 14. And Luke 21, 20, the Bible says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, because remember, God said that I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. He says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is not. That's why it's called the abomination of desolation. Why? Because when the image is set up, Jerusalem is made desolate. Now notice what happens. That, that know, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there, uh, there into. But these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that get suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And you say, well, what is going on here? You know, and I, I was talking with Pastor Anderson about this, and, and we're... You know, I was trying to make sure I understand this and figure this out, and we're kind of conversating. And it was interesting because uh, we were talking about the fact, and he was explaining to me really that the Jews, see, the Jews are looking for a Messiah, and they reject the Lord Jesus Christ as a Messiah. But the truth is this: that the Jews do not consider their Messiah the Son of God or God or deity in any way. See, the Jews are, are, are about one thing: money. And their Messiah is just someone that's supposed to show up, some man that's supposed to show up and basically conquer their enemies, make sure they're prospering, make sure they're, you know, uh, making money. That's who their Messiah is. And look, when the Antichrist shows up, they're going to get on board with the Antichrist. They're probably going to make a covenant, build a temple. The Antichrist is going to be their buddy, their best friend. They might even acknowledge him as Messiah and say he's taking care of us. We're prospering. Things are going well. But look, when he's declared God, they're probably not going to go along with that. Because they think the Messiah is just a man. Like a King David that's going to bring glory back to their nation, but he's going to die like any other man. And they're probably not going to be okay with the fact that he's declaring himself God. And then the Antichrist is going to basically turn on them. And he's going to make the city desolate, Jerusalem desolate, and destroy it and attack it. When does that happen? When the abomination of desolation is set up. And you say, well, why? Why? does it happen? Why is it that these things uh, happen? Well, you know, we read there in, in Luke 21, and I'll ask my place here in a second. Give me a second to find it. Notice verse 22, Luke 21, 22. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And look, you say, well, well why, why does God use the Antichrist? O often in Scripture you'll see that God will use one heathen to punish another heathen. Or he'll use one heathen to punish the Babylonians are punishing Judah. 
right? And then, you know, another, the, the Persians are uh, pu punishing the Babylonians, or the Medes are punishing the Babylonians. So here we have, it's just God's using the Antichrist as a tool to punish the Jews. You say, why? Because these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. See, the Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever as man soweth, that shall he also reap. And you know what? The Jews today are using their power and their power of finances to cause all sorts of war, to bring all sorts of desolation to different countries, to make themselves rich. And you know what? Before it's all said and done, they're going to get theirs. And God's going to use their beloved Antichrist who built their temple, who made them prosperous. As soon as he crosses the line and they, they're trying to pull back the strings on the puppet, he's just going to destroy them and make them desolate. And all of that happens when the abomination of desolation is put up. Now, what you say, well, well, well what else do we need to understand about the abomination of desolation? Well, here's what we need to understand. Here's where, where the preppers are, are going to love it. This is, when you, this is when you start, you know, counting. Yeah. 75 days. Yeah. Revelation 13. Go there. Revelation 13. And, you know, people will often accuse our movement and say, oh, you, you know, Pastor Anderson sets a date for the rapture. You know, or they're, they're setting dates for the rapture. Hey, look, if, if that's true, if, Pastor Perry said this to me, you know, if that's true, then what's the date? Yeah. I mean, they keep accusing us, you guys set a date. Then what's the date? I mean, what's the date that we're telling everybody, you know? We're, we're putting the billboards up all over America, you know, sell your houses, give us the money, here's the date. Hey, you know what? We don't have a date because the Bible simply tells us it's 75 days after the abomination of desolation. But when the abomination of desolation goes up, guess what? We'll have the date. And look, you, just, you don't need, I don't know why some of you guys have 20 guns. It's just 75 days. Oh, <laughs> well, 75 days of food and water. Couple guns, you should be good. Revelation 13. I know I'm in Arizona. I shouldn't say that. It's my California mentality, right? <laughs> Revelation 13. I'm going to be out there with a knife. Revelation 13 and verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man should buy or sell, save, meaning except, he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six six six. And we understand that the technology is there. It would be easy for them to put a chip or whatever on your right hand or on your forehead and control, you know, for security because of terrorism, to make sure everybody's safe, to make sure everybody's under control, to make sure we know exactly where you are at all times. You know, they're going to, you're going to put the mark. And here's the thing. If you refuse to take it, you can't buy or sell. And you have to submit yourself and worship. We don't know what really that all means. But you have to worship the image of the beast or you'll be killed. And, and, and this is what's known in Scripture as the Great Tribulation. Revelation 13 and verse 7 says this, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power is given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. I, you know, I recently had these morons in my church that were spreading that, you know, they're saying, Pastor Jimenez is not teaching the whole counsel of God. Because, you know, I was teaching, because I was basically telling these guys, like, you know, they were thinking, we need to go and destroy the government. That we, they were like, Didn't, weren't you in Babylon, USA? We got to destroy Babylon. I'm like, did you watch Babylon, USA? It says that he will make war with the saints and to overcome them. We're not going to be able to beat them. The only way we get to beat him is when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up. We don't have the power to, look, I, I get it, and we, we hate the government, I hate the government, I, you know, we hate the Jews and what they do, and I get that. But look, don't take it so far where you start thinking that, well, we, we got to make a militia and go fight the government because ba it's Babylon and it's USA and it's the Antichrist. Look, 
We cannot overcome him. He's going to overcome us. You don't have to turn there, Daniel 7, 21. And so don't tell me, you're not preaching the whole counsel of God. You obviously didn't get to Revelation 13. Daniel 7, 21, and I beheld, and I beheld. And the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Daniel 8, 24, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. See, this is the great tribulation. This is the tribulation of the saints. Go to Revelation chapter number 7. I have to hurry up. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out of time here. But let me give you one more thing. And then uh, I'm going to give you one more thing out of Revelation 7. Then we're going to go back to Zechariah real quickly. Back to Revelation and we'll be done. All right? Revelation chapter 7. Let's do it quickly. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. My wife and I, a couple of years ago, several years ago, were at a conference. Okay? You know, the Bible talks about confessing your faults one to another. It wasn't the prophecy conference, and it wasn't the Red Hot Preaching Conference, all right? But it was a conference of independent Baptists. You know, we just went, and we're trying to be edified and whatever. And this old man got up, and they were just praising this old man. He was the greatest thing ever, you know, because in the old IFB movement, the only thing you got to do to be a hero is you don't have to, like, do anything great. You don't have to fight any great battles. You just have to be old. If, you, if you're old, then you're automatically a hero, right? And this old man gets up, and I don't know how old he was, but he had to be like 75, 80 years old. And he gets up, and he's like, today we got these young kids that are trying to tell us that we're going to go through the tribulation. And I was like, hey, he's talking about me. <laughs> and he's like, these young bucks, they don't know what they're talking about. And he was preaching about the hope of heaven and the hope of the rapture. And he said, let me tell you about the rapture. And he said, take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 7. And I was like, wait a minute. That is the rapture. And I was like, man, is this guy going to preach the rapture? Like, wow, praise the Lord. Maybe this guy should be a hero, right? No, no. (laughs) Revelation 7. He gets to Revelation 7. He starts reading in verse number 9. And the Bible says this. After this, I beheld, and lo... A great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And he said, you see this? This is a great people. He said, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And he's saying, this is, isn't this going to be a great day when all of God's people are gathered together from all over the world? And I'm thinking to myself, is he going to stop right there? And he, gets, and he starts reading verse 10. He says, And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and upon the land. And he starts talking about, like, Isn't that going to be a great day? When we're crying, you know, Salvation to our God upon the throne and to the Lamb. And I'm like, Yeah, it's going to be a great day. And, he, and I thought, Is he going to stop right there? And he starts reading verse 11. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and four beasts and fell before the throne and their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor uh, and power and, uh, and might uh, be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And I thought to myself, surely he's going to stop reading right there. <laughs> but thank God for someone who is a little senile because I think he forgot the script. And, you know, in front of thousands of people, verse, and he starts reading verse 15, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And by then he's all wound up, so he's preaching it real excited. And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest, this is how he's preaching it, he said, and he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation. And then he stopped. <laughs> and seriously, like it dawned on him for the first time. And this is literally what he said in front of a thousand people. He said, well, even though it says great tribulation, we just have to have faith that God's not going to make us go through the tribulation. Amen? <laughs> and, and thousands of IFBs, amen! <laughs> and I was just like, good night. But you know what? He was right. Because the rapture is Revelation chapter 7. And they do come out of great tribulation. And if the rapture is not Revelation chapter 7, then show me where it is in the book of Revelation. It's not in chapter 1. It's not in chapter 2. It's not in chapter 3. It's dead sure not in chapter 4. 
It's not in chapter 5. It's not in chapter 6. Is, is prophecy. It's all tribulation. Where's the rapture? And then they'll say, well, there is no rapture in the book of Revelation. You mean to tell me that God wrote a book about end times and forgot the main event? I mean, the main thing, the rapture's not in the book of Revelation. No, it is in the book of Revelation. It's in chapter number 7. It's the great multitude that comes out of all nations and kindreds and tongues and people, and they come out of great tribulation. Because, you know, the Bible teaches the, the, the structure is chapter 6, tribulation, chapter 7, the rapture, chapter 8, the wrath of God. But we're not appointed unto wrath. Amen. Never said we were. It's the great tribulation. It's when the Antichrist sets up his one world government, one world religion where he's God, where he's in charge. He, they set up the abomination of desolation. He makes Jerusalem desolate, and he begins to persecute Christians and to make war with the saints and to kill them. And that's right before the rapture. Zech Zechariah chapter number 14, go back to it. And of course, you know the famous passage is Matthew 24, immediately after the great tribulation of those days. Zechariah 14. Let me just end with this. Because we talked about the we talked about the three rises of the Antichrist, right? There's a political rise. He establishes a one world government after a world war. He conquers some, he makes a league with others, he becomes the one world power. Then there's a physical rise. He takes a wound to the head. They declare him dead. He comes back as the son of, uh, as the man of sin, the son of perdition, ascended out of the bottomless pit. Satan himself is indwelling him. The false prophet creates an image, says we need to worship the beast. They give a mark. If you worship the beast, if you don't worship the beast, you can't buy or sell. You don't take the mark. They put you to death. The great tribulation. In Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 13, the Bible says this. Let's talk about, just real quickly, the fall of the Antichrist. How does he fall? And praise God that he falls. Zechariah 14 and verse 13, the Bible says this. Then shall the Lord go forth. And fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, keep in mind, he's not fighting against those nations to protect Jerusalem. He's the one that gathered the nations against Jerusalem. So we're fast-forwarding here from the abomination of desolation. We're fast-forwarding, uh, you know, the wrath of God to the second coming, you know, uh, to the battle of Armageddon. To the, the, that's all, all of that is considered the second coming. Obviously, we know the rapture is the second coming according to Scripture. Zechariah 14, 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount Olive of Olives. Now, isn't it interesting that when Jesus gave his famous discourse on end times, he gave it on the Mount of Olives? Yeah, an interesting thought that as they were on the Mount of Olives, the disciples come and they say, hey, what is the sign of thy coming? And he says, well, you know, it's kind of funny that you ask that question. Let me tell you a story. Zechariah 14, 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. I mean, could you imagine this day? And I don't really understand how this all works, but you could imagine the day as we read in Revelation 19. In fact, go there, Revelation 19, and verse number 11, where it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And could you imagine when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're coming behind him as his army, and he, and he comes, and I don't know how this is all going to play out, but he comes out on that, uh, on that horse, and then the Bible tells us that his foot, you know, I imagine he gets off the horse, and his foot, you know, in midair, and his foot touches the Mount of Olives, and the Mount splits in half. Uh, you know, I mean, could, I, could you imagine that day to see that happen, to see the Lord come in great power and glory? Verse 12. Revelation 19, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his 
head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses and clothed, uh, uh, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of the, his mouth goeth the sharp sword, and with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bound, both small and great. Isn't it funny how God declares a victory before the battles happen? And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image, and both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of, his, of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of, out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So you see, when we say, hey, I read at the end of the book, we win, it's true. <laughs> so when you see the one world government begin to form, when you see the world's cur currencies begin to merge, when you see, you know, the great falling away, don't get discouraged. Hey, realize that maybe we're just at the beginning of sorrows, but our redemption drive nigh. And we are on the winning side. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Bible, the Holy Spirit you've given us. We don't have to be deceived. We can learn and understand the scriptures. And Lord, I pray you'd help us, all of us, to go home and study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Father, I, I have been humbled this week, listening to these men stand up and preach the word. And it's just, it's, it's, it's rekindled a fire in my heart to study the Bible, to memorize the Bible, to know the Word of God. Lord, thank you for these men. Thank you for the people that are here that desire the truth, that would take time out of their schedules, uh, take money out of their finances to come to a place like this that they might be edified in the things of God. Lord, we love you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.